that begins with aspirational New Year's resolutions, often shattered long before January ends, causing rounds of self-recrimination, if not the age-old practice of self-flagellation. <laughs> These words of Benjamin Franklin's, who keenly worked on self-improvement, are timely. In his autobiography, Franklin tells us of a project he undertook when he was probably 20 years old. And here he begins. It was about this time I conceived the bold and arduous project of arriving at moral perfection. I wished to, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Think big. <laughs> I wished to live without committing any fault at any time. I would conquer all that either natural inclination, custom, or company might leap me into. As I knew, or thought I knew, what was right or wrong, I did not see why I might not always do the one and avoid the other. But I soon found I had undertaken a task of more difficulty than I had imagined. <laughs> While my care was employed in guarding against one fault, I was often surprised by another. Habit took the advantage of inattention. Inclination was sometimes too strong for reason. Franklin thus devised a list of 12 virtues, but then added a 13 because a Quaker friend, remember he was living in the city of Brother of Love, the Quaker residence, a Quaker friend pointed out that others thought Franklin was too proud, and he had this to say, my friend thought that my pride showed itself frequently in conversation, that I was not content with being in the right when discussing any point, but was overbearing and rather insolent. That is when Franklin added humility to his list. Said Franklin, I cannot boast of much success in inquiring the reality of this virtue, but I had a good deal with regard to the appearance thereof. <laughs> Fake it till you make it, right? In reality, there is perhaps no one of our natural passions so hard to subdue as pride, disguise it, struggle with it, beat it down, stifle it, Mortify it as much as one pleases, it is still alive and will every now and then peep out and show itself. You will see it perhaps often in this history, for even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome it, I should probably be proud of my humility. <laughs> Karen von Fossen graduated from United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities in 2015 and has been serving as the minister for the Bismarck Mandan UU congregation since August 2015. She possesses a depth of grace and understanding that is so needed in our world, and it is our privilege to have Karen serve as a guide on our journey together. Here then is the Reverend Karen Van Fossen. In this place, a number of decades ago, a mistake was made. Two young people in the parsonage of the church made a mistake. The mistake started out small and grew bigger over time until at last it was just about my size and my height. <laughs> okay. I'm starting here not to make light of the human condition in which we can't seem to avoid making mistakes but to honor it. <laughs> so these slides are kind of funny because we recognize in them that being human means making lots of mistakes. This can be what bothers us the most sometimes, just being human. Most people I know have a lot of frustration about humanity itself or the experience of being human. As Rita read this morning, we seem able to imagine a better world than we are often capable of manifesting in real life. This week's executive orders show me the limits of the human heart over and over again. Last night, I even wondered, how can I get up in front of you and talk about self-forgiveness when there are people, real people, real refugees, some of the most vulnerable, albeit courageous, people in the world literally detained, held, kept, refused, trapped in places and situations where they could be killed or worse, because someone who calls himself the president of my country, whom a minority of people in my country cast a vote for, signed one piece of paper, one official piece of paper, as if those lives don't matter, and as if those of us who insist they do 
do not have a voice. How can I, when people are dying, or very well will be dying, dare to talk to you about self-forgiveness for our infractions, or perceived infractions, which don't hold a candle to this? I'm talking about self-forgiveness with you this morning, because in times like these, we are going to be hurting. We are already hurting. We read the news, and even more, we feel the news. So we might as well let go of the hurt we don't need to have, because you matter. You matter mightily. Your life matters, and I want to affirm that with everything I've got. Everything you see in this image right here, these brilliant colors, powerful motion, even the very material of those stars, science tells us are contained within us, our bodies as well. We're not only in this picture, we are this picture. So, if we are going to forgive ourselves for the things we hold against ourselves, let's be clear about what those things are. Here are three kinds of things I believe we tend to hold against ourselves. Who we are or who we are not who we were going to be, and what we did. Who we are or are not, who we were going to be, or what we did. So our limitations, who we are or are not. One of my best friends in middle school, maybe she was your best friend too in your middle school, wanted to be tall. She was not tall. She was never tall. She persisted in being the opposite of tall. To this day, of all the words you might use to describe her, if you met her, not a one of them would be tall. What she was not was tall. This limitation wasn't her fault. In fact, you might even say it wasn't a limitation at all. But still, as human beings having human feelings, she held it against herself. Number two, who we were going to be, our regrets. I have them. I'm pretty sure you have them. Another longtime friend of mine is facing the reality that he cannot be all that he's expected to be, all that he has expected of himself. He's letting go of the dream, the story, even the hope of being a lifelong husband, of being the person he had imagined decades ago that he would be. Three. What we did, actual wrongdoing. This is the tough stuff, the things that rattle our conscience. Something we said or did or didn't say or do that we could have, we sense we should have. Everything from barking at another driver on the road to the things we don't wish to have said out loud. So how do we go about forgiving ourselves for these things? Even though they are three very different kinds of things, our basic limitations, <clears throat> life's regrets, and our actual wrongdoing, it seems to me that they function in our psyches, or some would say our souls, in much the same way. So concisely put, <clears throat> I believe it comes down to telling the truth, saying goodbye to what might have been, and returning home to our center. So telling the truth doesn't just mean, or even mean, being harsh. Sometimes the truths we most need to tell are truths of love and gratitude that sometimes get caught in our throats. Saying goodbye, like many things in life, is a practice. As you, many of you know, I have an honorary four-year-old granddaughter. <clears throat> And one of her places, and therefore my favorite, one of her favorite places, now one of my favorite places in the whole world is the Heritage Center. Have you been up to the tree house up there? And you can pretend you're driving a 
plane that really <coughs> is like a real cockpit, and you can pretend you're, there's an actual fire hose there, um, which some kids think looks just like a camera. Either way, it's extremely fun and hard to let go of at the end. So we have a practice when it's time to go of saying, bye-bye people, bye-bye airplane, bye-bye dinosaurs, which she's learning how to pronounce, bye-bye tractor, and on and on. Letting go is one of the most consistent callings in each of our lives. Returning home to our center might go something like this. Being here, being now, being together, and breathing. I invite you to do all of those as often as you can. You don't have to do the breathing part that fast. <laughs> so, can you tell what this is in the, the relative darkness and light that we're in? Okay, it's not a giraffe, right? But it's really cute. <laughs> right. So my friend who wanted to be tall might tell the truth this way. Okay, so my body isn't tall, but my body is still beautiful. I can't do all the things, but I can do some things. I may not be able to reach tall trees, but I sure do love the water. Can't you just feel the water? Looking at that hippopotamus, and I don't know if you can see, there are all kinds of, I don't know if it's hippopotamuses or hippopotami around there, uh, in the water together. That's real life, tall or not tall. My friend who's facing divorce might say goodbye in any number of ways to the person he expected himself to be. He might contemplate a memorial service for the dream that got away. He might look in the mirror and say hello to who he is, letting go of even looking for who he isn't. When we've actually done a wrongdoing and we wish to forgive ourselves, telling the truth to ourselves is the beginning. So I'm going to do this. I, I went through all my recent infractions, <laughs> and I landed on this one. <laughs> I think you can handle it, and I can handle it. That's why I chose this one. We'll see. Let me know, because there's a second service. If this was not the infraction to choose, I hope you'll give me that feedback immediately. <laughs> there are any what number of ways you can do so. So the other day, I hoarded my snack, and I didn't offer to share. <laughs> And it's really, really bothering me. So, no, well, please leave it there, sorry. Then, now, I need to say goodbye to what might have been. So, I lost the opportunity because I hoarded that snack to sit with a friend and chat over those dried cranberries. They didn't taste half so good by myself later, I'll tell you that for sure. We might have talked about the foods we love and the places we've enjoyed them. Maybe she doesn't even like dried cranberries. I don't even know now. So I lost the opportunity to feel my heart expand like it does when I share. And I lost some respect for myself. So when the time is right, we, I, can come home to our common humanity, our center. I'm human. I'm not God. Some of us believe in God. Some of us believe in other things that would never be called God. And I think as a whole we agree no one in this room is God. Even so, as a human being, I contain the spark of life, its essence, what some of us might call its divinity. This energy, this essence of life is in me just as this essence and energy of life is in the stars. So I forgot this essence of life in me when I withheld the stuff of life from a loved one. The more I remember this essence of life in me, the more I gain capacity to reflect it in my world. 
Forgiving ourselves has everything to do with the balance between responsibility and flexibility. Holding the bird of life in our hands, firmly enough for support, gently enough to fly. Some of the things, most of the things I believe, that we hold against ourselves aren't about the need for self-forgiveness at all, but self-love, self-acceptance, and self-compassion. As our beloved song goes, how could anyone ever tell you you were anything less than beautiful? How deeply you all are connected to my soul. Thank you. View your life with kind sight. Stop beating yourself up about things from your past. Instead of slapping your forehead and asking, what was I thinking? Breathe. And ask the kinder question, what was I learning? 